Hello, everybody, and welcome to podcast episode number 348. And have you heard what is happening at our national and state parks? There is major crowding and confusion. Welcome, fellow travelers. It's time for another episode of the RV Podcast. Answering your questions, sharing tips, suggesting great trips and off the beaten path adventures, and always staying on top of the RV lifestyle news you need to know about with great interviews and inside industry information. Here's your hosts, award winning journalists Mike and Jennifer Wendland. Hi, everybody. We're Mike and Jennifer Wendlin, and welcome to another episode of the RV Podcast. I believe this is number 348. 348, and right off the bat, we want to welcome our brand new RV Podcast viewers on our RV Lifestyle channel on YouTube. You've been asking us for, what, how many years have we been doing this? Five years, six forever. years. I think it's six years. <laughs> six years. And people say, "Oh, do a video version. Do a video version." And we, you know, we didn't until now. This is the very first one, and uh, uh, just like the audio one is released on Wednesday, the video one will be also. It's the same content, but the video folks get to see a little bit of video. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to talk in this episode about campground confusion and crowding. Um, and we're going to start in our news of the week in just a couple of minutes uh, by talking about what's going on at our national parks. It's it's crazy. It's getting crazy out there. All these new regulations and people just aren't aware of that things have changed. They've changed the game rules. And it's hard to know what's going on because it varies from park to park to park. And all these poor folks that... Uh, pack up and excited, got their couple of days or their week planning and they get there and you have to reserve a time that you're going to arrive. It's um, massive confusion. It is. That's coming up in the news of the week segment, segment which is just a, a couple of minutes away. And uh, in our interview of the week, we're going to kind of continue that discussion. We're going to talk about state parks and I suppose some county parks. And this trend that you have been seeing in campgrounds everywhere, which is you have to have reservations, uh, an increasing number of state park systems around the country are going to reservations only. And um, that excludes uh, an entire category of campers, often people like us who <laughs> haven't a clue where we're going to be next week, let alone having to make a reservation six months uh, from now. So and it's not that easy always to make a reservation. No. People say, well, get organized. But, but it but isn't always possible. We are organized, but sometimes our travel go like goes like that. And, and we're going to talk to a guy who uh, is in a similar situation, but he is actually trying to do something about it. He has uh, written a, a proposal to state and national campground administrators that would set aside 25% of all the campsites in a state park or a national park for those who um, are uh, first come first first serve for people who don't have the luxury of making travel reservations in advance. So I think that's gonna be an interesting interview and that's coming up. We are uh, coming to you from uh, hot and humid Michigan. That it is. And um, uh, I mean, it is hot and humid. We take Bo for a hike every morning, and we should remind you, if you have a dog and you're uh, in this weather and, and you're not used to this weather, your animal is stressed much faster and much more than you are. Especially since we have a dog that's made for snow. He was. He was. Uh, so uh, a couple of other announcements. Uh, one of the things we're doing uh, is this week we're working on some review videos of uh, different prod products and services that... Uh, help us in the RV lifestyle. So that's coming out. But the thing that's taking up most of our time is our books. We're really excited. We've got two things to talk about our books. One, a hardcover print version of our boondocking I guide. I think people like me, I like a hardcover book in my hand. So I'm sure there's a lot of other folks out there that are looking forward to having it having it in their hands. And that's that's coming out. Rather uh, than on their device. Really soon. We're really excited. It's our boondocking book. It's you know, uh, 160 plus pages, but it's actually something you can physically hold. So that's coming out. And then uh, our next travel guide is an epic adventure, multi-day, multi-week, depends on how you want to take it. And that was uh, uh, the, it's going to be released in just a couple of weeks. 
the Great Lakes Shoreline Tour. It's, U.S. side. Yeah, U.S. side. Do you remember how many miles that was? 4,000? Whoa. 4,000 plus if you follow all of our suggestions. So that's coming up and uh, we'll be releasing that hopefully in time for the 4th of July uh, rush and everybody gets going. So we'll, and that's an ebook. It'll be an ebook first and, and uh, hopefully we'll do a print version of it too. But uh, two books coming. We're pretty excited. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, the RV news of the week. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 at checkout when you visit CampingWorld.com. The coupon code again is RV Lifestyle 10. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RV Lifestyle 10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. If you've visited an RV park lately, surely, besides all the RVs, you've seen these e-bikes. Jennifer and I are proud e-bike owners, and the e-bike that we chose are Rad Power Bikes, America's number one e-bike brand offering direct-to-consumer pricing on powerful premium electric bikes. Jen and I love our Rad Power Bikes. We use them to go around the campground, to explore the area we're in. I have the city bike version. Hers is the step-through model. And those are just two of a whole bunch of different models offered by Rad Power Bikes. All of them can reach 20 miles an hour with zero pedaling. But of course, you can also pedal. And you've got five different levels of pedal assist to make the going just a little bit easier and fun. You can go between 20 to 40 miles on a single charge. Now, here's the deal. You can save $75 off if you use the coupon code RV Lifestyle at checkout. Plus, of course, free shipping. Check them out. Radpowerbikes.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. Now for our RV news of the week. Now, we want to talk about what's going on. Uh, we'll start with our national parks. In the wake of this unprecedented RV boom with so many millions of new people coming to the RV lifestyle. It is having a major effect on our national parks. And so as a result of that, uh, they've enacted um, at the most popular in-demand national parks, some new policies and some new laws. And the first thing is that many of them are now requiring you to make in advance, you have to even buy it online, uh, a reservation a timed reservation to enter the park at a certain time and date. You only have a short, narrow window that you can do. So that's the first one. That could get confusing, couldn't it? Because if you had your timed reservation and people were lined up and you couldn't, I presume they would be gracious. <laughs> well, know? yeah. But there's a big lineup and you can't get in. Plus there's a fee. There is a fee. Reservation. Now there's already an entry fee, right? That hasn't changed. You still pay that. Or if you have that, uh, uh, golden pass or whatever they call it now for seniors so you can get in free. But um, there is a fee to get in. And this is a new fee on top of that for that time reservation. Now, it's not that much of a fee. It's just a couple of dollars. But, you know, it seems like everything starts off small and then it, it gets more costly in not that long a period of time. But you can get in if you arrive before 9 a.m. Or after 6 p.m. But that, uh, you know, what if that big lineup and it's suddenly 9, 10 a.m.? <laughs> oh, we got our reservation. Can you see that there is a whole lot of confusion out there? And nobody needs all that stress. You know, this is a vacation. Let's um, kind of recount some of the things that are going on that is uh, causing this to be such a mess. CBS TV in Denver had a story with their reporter standing out in front of Rocky Mountain National Park. 
showing huge traffic jams and all sorts of confusion about the timed entry. Many people didn't even know that it was in effect. They interviewed one visitor who with his wife and kids drove three hours to get there only to be turned away. And it isn't just there in Colorado that there's problems. Twitter has been full of photos showing long lines at Grand Canyon National Park. We'll show some on our YouTube RV Lifestyle channel. There were massive traffic jams getting into the park's south entrance. But even once you got in, in many cases, there weren't any parking spots. All the parking lots were filled and people were driving around and around, sometimes for a couple of hours. And the trails were jammed too. One photo we'll share on our YouTube version of the podcast shows how crowded the trails down into the canyon was. People were shoulder to shoulder going both ways. On Memorial Day weekend, there were over 200 calls for emergency assistance at Grand Canyon. There were a lot of new hikers who tried that strenuous hike who didn't bring enough water. And with temperatures over 100 degrees down in the canyon, you can imagine the medical problems they had to deal with. In Utah, the shuttle buses were so filled at Zion National Park that some of those on the scene said they had to wait as long as two hours. The popular trails were all very crowded. At Arches National Park, we saw a photo of so many people hanging around on the rocks that it looked like a crowd for a music concert. It did. I mean, they were all happy. You know, yeah. I mean, how could you not be happy at Arches National right. Park? So but, pretty. but you know, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. Now, I, I, this is not to slam the National Park Service, uh, but uh, that's what the situation is because of the RV boon and this these these new policies. And we haven't even started to talk about the campgrounds now. The campgrounds, oh my goodness. Unless you have made, at the most popular campgrounds, uh, if you have not made a reservation a year or more in advance, sometimes more, um, you're not getting in. Now, you stand a better chance, you know, during the middle of the week, and there are some national park properties where, you know, you, you can probably get in most days, except weekends and stuff. But um, this is tough. And we're talking particularly the most popular parks, you know, the Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, Glacier, uh, Arches or Zion. Those are huge parks with a lot of people in them. And I don't know what the solution is. Uh, but, you know, the one thing, you know, we just have people from the states trying to use these parks right now. Can you yeah. imagine when uh, the crowds start coming who come from other countries, you know, busloads of people that come on Guided oh yeah, tours. yeah. We don't have all those folks yet. Yeah, that's still shut down foreign travel because of uh, the you know the waiting to get the COVID situation around the world mm -hmm. settled. So all these crowds are without the normal crowds yeah. who come from overseas. So what what do you do? What 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 do we do? How do we solve this problem or cope with it? Well, I think uh, they're doing the best they can with all these suggested times you're arriving, but it, it's going to be difficult to get everybody retrained and uh, people just don't know. So you're talking about the people in patience, got to have patience, got to have some patience, but people just don't know. I don't know how you educate people I other think, than programs like this. And, and, and yeah, we need to keep telling you about the, the timed reservations that are necessary. Okay. A timed reservation. Can you imagine traveling with a bunch of kids oh. and flat tire, you know, things that happen that slow yeah. you down a little bit. Yeah. Can we stop yet? Can we stop? I got to go to the bathroom. You know, we got to get there at 9 a.m. Before 9 a.m. Or we're going to get there at 9, so 10, 10 to 11. A whole new layer of stress. And then, uh, so patience, obviously. Uh, if you can make reservations, uh, try to not camp during the peak times, which would be weekends. And, you know, right before the 4th of July, on the 4th of July, the week after the 4th of July. And if I can say, those of you who made your reservations have done their homework, you made that reservation. If for some reason you can't make it, please cancel. Oh, please. Uh, so many people don't. They just, just they don't show up. Ah, oh, it's too late. And, and then they have to hold that spot. Hopefully the phone service is better than the first time we went out uh, to a yellow, Yellowstone because we had a reservation and we couldn't get cell service to cancel. 
Yeah. Hopefully things have improved. Yeah. Uh, well, Yellowstone still has a lot of places where you can't get through. Right. Uh, you know, and then the uh, the other thing is find alternate ways to camp. You know, do a lot more boondocking or mooch docking or widen your search around the popular national parks and, and stay at some of the commercial, uh, the huge, there's some big commercial uh, campgrounds almost around every national park. So try those. Now, as we said, that's for the national uh, parks. The state parks around the country are also experiencing a lot of stress. And that's going to be the topic of uh, what we're going to talk about in our interview of the week segment, which is coming up in a little bit uh, uh, with more information. So now the question is, uh, what do you do about it? Uh, back to that one P word, patience, right? I don't think what else what else we can say. Prepare. Prepare. Yeah, <laughs> prepare patience. We need another prepare, one. Prepare, we need one more. And plan. <laughs> prepare, <laughs> patience, and plan. Uh, all right, one other story that I thought was pretty interesting that came from KOA, Campgrounds of America. And uh, they are obviously aware of how many calls they get from people who want to camp at this KOA and only to find that it's filled. So they have come up with a, a new plan that uh, kind of leverages technology. Yeah, Camp Grounds of America has a new search function on its website that permits users to look for an open campsite at multiple campgrounds at once. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I think that's a really good deal if you can uh, if you can just uh, have the patience to say, well, I can't stay at this one, but maybe if we go 30 miles down the road, we can get into here. But that's a great step in uh, using technology. Uh, third story that we want to just touch on, and that's kind of a tip of the hat to our friends at Harvest Host and also Boondockers Welcome. Harvest Host has just acquired Boondockers Welcome. So that's going to give you more people in there, more places in their network where you can overnight. And uh, it'll that's be easier be great. for people to figure it out because instead of two different places, there'll be one big place with lots of options. All right. That's our RV News of the Week. We'd love to hear your comments. You can reach us at Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. We'll be right back after this. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Let's talk about protecting your RV from the elements. And the best way we know how to do that is with empirecovers.com, makers of quality covers for your RV that will protect them from rain, mud, pollen, and other elements that you have to waste your time cleaning or worse that can end up damaging your vehicle. Whether you own an RV, a travel trailer, or a camper, EmpireCovers.com is here to help you protect all your vehicles against Mother Nature. They offer high-quality, affordable covers that are engineered to protect every cover. Comes with a free warranty to guarantee it remains durable. The RV podcast listeners can receive free shipping plus an extra 15% off their entire order. Visit them at EmpireCovers.com slash RV Lifestyle. EmpireCovers.com slash RV Lifestyle. EmpireCovers.com. Protect what you love. Welcome back, everybody. And now it's time for the RV questions of the week. Well, I got one right here for you. All this right. one is for you. And, uh, it says, uh, Jennifer, I saw the video you and Mike did on your favorite road food and fun restaurants. It's on our RV Lifestyle <laughs> channel. Uh, um, how often do you eat all, out when you are traveling? And I also liked watching the videos where you shared the recipes you use for making camping meals ahead of time. 
Will you be doing more of them? We really like that Tuscan chicken recipe <laughs> you prepared. And that uh, question comes from Angie. All right. We try not to eat out when we're on the road. We, I try to prepare food ahead of time and take everything with us that I can. I, if it's, especially if it's a short trip, I can go A, B, C, D. It's fun to eat out. It's fun to eat local food. But the unfortunate thing is that uh, when you eat out normally, there's too much salt, too much sugar, too much fat. And uh, yeah, and it, it's it's <laughs> yeah. hard. You have to be disciplined, especially if you spend a lot of time on the road traveling because you think you're on vacation and you've got to take care of your machine, your body. You've got to eat right, drink water, and you got to be good. So uh, we have that element. And as far as that Tuscan chicken, I've been, I got that from my daughter-in-law, Lori, I'm going to have to, Tell Lori she's got to come up with some more recipes for me. No, I'm glad Angie's everybody question, liked that. Angie's question is: Are you going to show more of you cooking? And uh, and actually, somebody sure. asked us that on Ask Us Anything the other night on YouTube as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I've been thinking that maybe you need to do some cooking, and I'll photograph you, video you. Hello, doing. <laughs> hello Jets Pizza. Can you deliver to an RV park? Yeah, <laughs> and they all can, by the way. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe we should ask our uh, viewers and listeners to send us in some recipes and uh, we'll kind of pick the, maybe the top three that we really like, <laughs> that we oh, think that we'll will like. offend everybody else? Well, you know, send us, we'll just say we had so many of them. We only picked these <laughs> three, but send us some and we'll pick three of them that we like that, you know, meet our food uh, taste and we'll show you how to. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't you do have, that. You're discriminating with your food taste. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to make I these mean, recipes, I'm I want to like it like myself. I've only snickerdoodles, I think, is the only thing I've found in life that you don't like. I don't like snickerdoodles, snickerdoodle, but, but in an emergency, I'll eat one. <laughs> okay. If, um, okay. But anyway, if you have some recipes you'd like us to make that you are really excited about, that you want to share with the community, we'll give you credit for it. Uh, we'll get uh, Jennifer and I'll help her. I'll do the cutting and slicing. It is fun to get recipes so, that other people think are awesome. Send us those recipes at Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Mike and Jen, RVLifestyle.com. I don't have keep, to work too hard. Keep them simple. Uh, okay. Uh, here is a question that came to us uh, on a recent Ask Us Anything from one of our uh, video viewers, Ronnie Kaoli. Cool. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Please excuse my ignorance. Have you ever had a flat tire uh, while uh, running? How did you react to it? Well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> What's the <laughs> safest thing to do aside from not panicking? Thanks. I had the flat tire when I was driving. And uh, some man was trying to tell me this like twice. And I'm like, who are you? Leave me alone. <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to figure out he was trying to tell me that my tire was. And then when the car started or when the van started feeling fine, I thought, oh, I got a flat tire. Ah! And uh, luckily, you do? we well, got. How did you handle we it? We got. We just had to drive it. <laughs> you know, there was nothing to do. And uh, I just got off at the next exit. We were on I 75 somewhere near Kentucky in Kentucky. I don't remember what city. And you pulled off and. Two miles down the road was a tire shop. Mm -hmm. We pulled in. They said, yeah, we can fix it. It's the restaurant two doors down. We went to the restaurant, had dinner, came back. Car was all fixed. Now, fortunately, we were we had enough uh, in the thing to drive to get to that. I mean, the next exit was right up the road, and we could drive. If it had gone completely flat, we couldn't have driven it. Uh, we, we just would have, would have pulled off. We would have called Good Sam and uh, had him come, and, they, you know, they – you know, all those services are good. Sam, CoachNet, they all work the same. Leisure Travel Van has has their own. Most manufacturers have their own service, road service. and uh, But they all work to the same numbers and, and same deals. And they would have come and, and repaired it for us. That wasn't as scary as when I was driving and there was a road work. There, were, there weren't any shoulders. And it was a two-lane road, you know, both directions, traffic. Texas. And we were running out of gas. <laughs> and then I wanted... Yeah to strangle you because <laughs> you're know. one of those people that how long can we go? And I'm like, when it hits a quarter of a tank, we could go I'm a just, long way. <laughs> as it turned out. <laughs> I was like, I can't even pull over and have him drive. You know, I'm yeah, going no to run out of gas. There's no place to pull over. Ah, that was fun. That was fun. All RVers need specialized emergency transportation coverage to cover air and ground ambulances, return to home services and vehicle return. 
you only have a 68% chance that those services will be completely covered by your major medical. The sad reality is that a lot of people believe they have that coverage, but it turns out most carriers that claim to cover air ambulances only cover you for a hospital-to-hospital -hospital transfer and offer no coverage to get you to the initial hospital in the first place. The truth is 68% of air ambulances are hospital to hospital. Here's a map of all the places in the U.S. that getting to the hospital in the golden hour is not possible without an air ambulance. And with an average cost of $52,481 for an air ambulance, why would you take the risk? Go to peaceofmindforrvs.com today and take a look at the true emergency transportation coverage they offer that covers it all. The coverage can save your life and your life savings. Check it out, peaceofmindforrvs.com. Jennifer and I are members, and we urge you to consider it too. Peaceofmindforrvs.com. Hey, fellow travelers, want to have your voice featured on the RV podcast? Send us your questions or comments. Send an audio file to mike at rvlifestyle.com. Or better yet, use our RV podcast voicemail number, 586-372-6990. 586-372-6990. We want to hear from you. Call 586-372-6990. Have you had it with overbooked, overcrowded campgrounds? Then check out Harvest Hosts, where RVers can overnight for free at more than 2,400 wineries, farms, microbreweries, golf courses, and attractions. Harvest Host is a membership service for those with self-contained RVs looking for unique, beautiful, and peaceful overnight camping experiences across North America. When you become a member of Harvest Host, you can camp for free at all these places. Jennifer and I are Harvest Host members, and we've made so many great memories at Harvest Host locations. There's no charge for camping, and your Harvest Host membership fee is easily made up with just a couple of stays. Plus, you have awesome places to stay. If you use our special affiliate link of rvlifestyle.com slash hh, you'll automatically get 15% off the cost of your membership. That's 15% off, but you must use the special link, rvlifestyle.com slash hh. Welcome back, and now it's time for our interview of the week. Now, this interview is uh, a guy I heard about first on one of the RV forums, and uh, he wrote a very calm, non-judgmental, non-argumentative uh, treatise, if you will, about what's wrong with uh, the reservation-only system that is being adapted by so many state parks around the country. And what our, um, our guest, uh, his contention was that that excludes an entire category of RVers, people much like us who don't uh, have the ability, you know, to plan out six months in advance because we don't know where we're going to be. You know, things change and we travel and we go here and we go there. And there are a lot of other people uh, that are in that boat. And when it's reservations only, you are locked out. Or if you find maybe uh, an empty campground for the night, you, you you know you pull up and you say, hey, you got anything? Yeah, I got something for tonight. Well, great. Can I stay two nights? That's the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in the site, you could extend your stay. Now you can't because those sites are reservation only. And the only ones they give you, uh, you know, uh, on the spot when you show up are the ones that there was no reservation for it that night. And that just doesn't seem fair. So our interview of the week is uh, with a guy named R. Winston Slater, and he is a retired attorney, uh, so he knows how to write a good letter, but he did this all very kindly and very supportive, and uh, I think he makes a really uh, great point about how to maybe make a couple exceptions in this reservations only. And We'd like to hear your thoughts, but first, listen to the interview of the week. Well, Winston joins us right now from his RV. And uh, first, let me just say thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast today. Of course, our pleasure. And you are in, uh, you might as well tell everybody, because they're all looking and saying, well, what kind of an RV is that? We see your bikes on the back. Uh, it looks like a Class B. Um, what, what, you're in a yeah. Class B? What kind is it? This is a, a ProMaster. And you might say, well, who, who built it out? And then, well, 
you're looking at them. This is a, a DIY homebrew uh, ProMaster. It's the 159 standard length wheelbase, just about, well, we say 20 feet, but when you add that bike rack and those guys on those ferry boats are measuring, they sometimes come up with 22 feet. Oh, awesome. Uh, well, congratulations. That's a big movement. Everybody's going back to D DIY seems to be a huge trend in Class Bs because it's, taking, noticed, the, yeah. it's taking the manufacturers years now to build something new. But that's another topic. Uh, let's talk about camping. And we have done a lot of stories uh, here on our podcast and on our blog and, and YouTube about how hard it is to find a reservation. They're, they're all, you know, I don't, I don't want to... Uh, say that the campground industry is lying, but, you know, they're all booked up for the rest of the summer, you know, not just weekends, but almost everywhere you go. Start with your experience a couple of weeks ago, and then let's see if we can find a way, uh, at least a suggestion, your suggestions actually, and how we can maybe tweak that reservation system and have a little more equity for people. So what happened to you that set this letter that you wrote, uh, what set that off? Well, we've been, you know, both tent camping and now in the last four years, uh, uh, Class B camping for about seven or eight years. And in fact, we retired about then and, and we put on about 250,000 miles driving around the country. And I'll get off, uh, off lane just long enough to give you a little background. And that is we are geocachers. And I assume many, many uh, yep. listeners would know what geocaching is. And we took it upon ourselves to find a single geocache in every county of the United States. And we wow. completed that uh, a year ago. And in doing so, we have been, we like to say literally everywhere, but anyway, 250,000 miles. But this has put us on kind of a random schedule, wandering without a lot of pre-planning for now seven years over 200, this 250,000 miles. And not too long ago, we ran into uh, one of our, uh, what, to a state park in Texas. And uh, as a, you know, uh, an intrepid uh, kind of wandering camper, we kind of learned the ropes. You have to get there midweek, say no later than Thursday if you want to have a shot at the weekend. Obviously, the weekend's the busiest time everywhere. So we arrived Thursday and said we're looking for a campsite. And then the uh, campground administrator there, the, uh, the employee says, great, we got lots of them. And I said, I'll be here until uh, Sunday night. And kind of snapped back and said, no, you won't. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, this is completely booked tomorrow night uh, and Saturday night. I said, you mean if I get a campsite here? And by the way, this is a rhetorical question. I knew the answer already from my experiences, but I still had to ask him the question. You mean if I get the campsite tonight, I don't get to keep it for uh, until I leave until tomorrow night or Sunday? No, this is all reservation. So then I finally looked at him. I said, well, you know, we're from Michigan, thousand plus miles from here. You got any recommendations what we should do tomorrow night? And the guy paused for a while, then looked at me and says, Sir, maybe you should go home. So we <laughs> started. had a rough day, I think. I think <laughs> yeah. you'd had a rough day. Well, you know, um, I understand you can't hold a lot of campsites open. And, you know, I, well, whatever I understand, but here's the point. That answer I didn't expect. But anyway, I got online and I started researching not just Texas, but I, I, all the major states. The truth is, is that all of their campground sites during the peak season or during the normal travel season on weekends are booked. And they're booked months in advance, sometimes as much as six months or more in advance. The really popular campground spots, of course, get completely booked seconds, if not minutes, after they open the reservation. And some of that can be a year in advance. So if you don't know where you're going to be a year from now, you're locked out of the Texas campgrounds. And this is true, by the way, as you know, in many other states, not just there, and many, you know, national. Are. It's, yes, it's, in our experiences, it's in virtually every state, not necessarily a 100% reservation, but why we finally decided it was time to try to enlist the help of, you know, write the letter and enlist the help of others, was the trend was becoming increasingly obvious that in a few years, there may be no campsites whatsoever of any significance anyway that are not reservation in advance. And now, 
Let, let's go on to this letter that you wrote, and that—that's what I—I I saw it on the Class B forums, and I said, "This is this is a great idea." Uh, just summarize that in thirty seconds or so, uh, kind of a closing argument, if you will, <laughs> about uh, what what you wrote in that, and and then let's talk about how that would help the. Uh, help all of us and that are trying to find a place. To well, it, it's a little difficult to raise this because everybody is so used to reservations for everything. You know, it would be unthinkable to go to a Cubs game in Chicago or, or to a concert without a reservation. So it seems so normal to people that they don't understand that there's any other way of doing it. But there has always been another way of doing it in camping. And that's the first come first serve. And there's a huge single difference between first come first serve and reservations. And that is that once you light on a spot, once you obtain a spot as a first come first serve person, you get to keep it until you leave. This provides you at least a chance if you get there earlier in the week, like Thursday, of staying through Saturday and Sunday, and then you can just go on from there. So the first portion of our argument is to suggest that not everybody in the world can plan their lives in advance. There are many very legitimate reasons, health reasons. We had one. We all of a sudden had to go undergo treatments that the doctor said we shouldn't wait. So we had to cancel all of our plans. There are people that have family obligations, business. There's a lot of legitimate reasons why people can't plan six months in advance. And then there's a whole set of people, and I fall into that category now. For 45 years, I didn't literally punch into a punching clock, but I had to respond every day and plan my life. And I was a family man and had four children, and we went camping, and we had the plan. We knew six months in advance, and we could at that time, if there had been reservation systems, we could have made use of the reservation systems. And that's part of the letter. Reservation systems are great. They're, I can't imagine not having them for most people, but not Everybody fits into that category, and we as seniors are now, you know, essentially impromptu, we call it in our letter, impromptu campers that just wander. There is no concept what state I'm going to be in next week. Probably won't be Michigan. We've been here most of the spring, so we're going to get out and travel. So no way of knowing where we're going to be. And with the reservation system, you are essentially locking out a class of traveler. This is the first time we've ever locked out a class of traveler. Um, yes, it was tough back in the old days with re no reservations and everybody would fight there on uh, Friday night to get a spot. So I think this is a much improved system so long as we don't make it 100%. We leave, in our suggestion, is just leave a quarter of the site available for people who don't plan or can't plan months in advance. Now, with so many people full timing and the whole van life movement that has swept the RV industry, this, there's a lot of this out there. You call it, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, what was the term you used for 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 it uh, for that kind of camping? Impromptu. Impromptu. I call yeah, it ser yeah. serendipity camping. Uh, yeah. well, okay. We're not sure where we're going to be tonight because I don't know for sure where I'm going to be this afternoon. I'm I'm exploring. I'm traveling. Now, your yeah. solution is to leave a quarter of those sites, right? What was the yes. reaction when you, now you've sent that, where did you send that letter and then tell us the reaction to it? Um, it was tough finding recipients because there's no one repository that we could identify online of addresses in personnel, but we generally tried to identify the, the head administrator of every state park. Uh, by state park, I mean state park system. We did not write to every individual state park. We did the same at the federal level, whether it be Army Corps, BLM lands, uh, you know, Forest Service or national parks. We tried to identify the, the, the honchos and we sent them letters. Then we sent a whole bunch of selected letters to places that we've been that we knew there were problems. Some of them like Rocky Mountain National Park and some of the big ones. We have probably received not, not a great number of letters, but we received some letters and a lot of emails uh, thanking us for our uh, input. They'll take it into consideration. Uh, some of them are very sympathetic. Many of them, particularly some forest service out in the West, uh, point out how many campgrounds remain open for first come, first serve, for which we're obviously very grateful. Um, 
And then we get a lot of letters, and I'm afraid to say the one we got from Michigan was not too too helpful. It was, you know, making uh, a bunch of excuses why this might be inconvenient for them, either financially or because of personnel or other complications. It's easier for them to set up a reservation-only system, for which I would answer there's a lot of solutions. I've seen kiosks in a number of locations that would help with at least the personnel problem. But frankly, these are treasured national and state resources, and and there should be supervised that all have access to it. And if it costs the state or federal park a little extra money because they have to have personnel there, or if they don't necessarily fill their coffers as full as they might have because it got rainy and people, because they didn't reserve, never showed up, there's going to be maybe some financial downside. But these are small prices to be paid. I'm not talking about commercial campgrounds, KOAs and the, and the like. I'm talking about the national and state parks, the stewards of these precious limited resources ought to be sure that we don't exclude a class of user. Now, you have taken this on yourself. Uh, I know a lot of our followers are going to hear this and, and they'll have a reaction to it. And I, I think uh, knowing our audience that many are going to say, yeah, you know, it, particularly now this year, when it's so hard to get a spot, uh, where does this go from now? You've sent these letters out. I, I think uh, your exposure here will, uh, the industry is going to pay some attention to this. Um do you, see, do you see yourself as the leader of this movement or somebody's going to have to take the ball and run with it? Well, I'm just hoping I'll find somebody on my left and on my right side to walk with me and, and march forward. It's very obvious that one person cannot talk a nation, change the course of, of the reservation system. We need a lot of voices. And my voice, is, by the way, has been raised, I would say, for four or five years in the subject. And I've bent every ear to the point of, probably uh, annoyance of every campground director and administrator uh, I've had an opportunity to talk to. Uh, but in talking to other campers, it's amazing how often I find people that are very, very sympathetic, but have practically become resigned that this is the way it's going to be and there's nothing we can do about it. And the, the neat thing about speaking up is individuals who do speak up get to carry more weight than their pro rata share. So what I'm really trying to do now, rather than my being the continual voice, I'm looking for people to join me, write letters to their various state parks. And because there seems to be a huge amount of support behind the scenes, I'm just not sure how much of that support is really being communicated to the people, the campground administrators, the people that count. So uh, at a very minimum, uh, people should write, let people know this. Somebody's going to take charge of this. They're going to start a website and people are going to follow through and stuff. Uh, I, I, I want to end this with something you said right at the top, uh, Winston, and that had to do with um, at the rate we're going now with this problem, this is going to be the end of, of uh, a lot of camping for a lot of people because there's no room in the campground. They don't change things. I think uh, I think you're on a great uh, on a great uh, topic here. Hey, thank you for spending some time on this, and uh, we hope to run into you out there on the road. And uh, I wish you great success. Thank you for being a voice, and let's hope that some of our folks join you in raising their voice against this. Well, Mike, you have no idea how much I appreciate your giving me this few minutes to to talk to your uh, your viewers. Well, we'll get the word out. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. So what'd you think? What'd you think? I think he's got a lot of good points there. Yeah. Now he, he makes the exception for commercial campgrounds, private campgrounds. Right. Cause private campgrounds, that is your livelihood. And you've got to, you've got to make money when you can. We wouldn't want to restrict anybody. Now we've stayed at a couple of private campgrounds where we've gone. Uh, I think of the Munising tourist park, a little County oh, park, that up park in the upper peninsula. And they had a um, overflow area. And that was really helpful. Oh, it's so helpful if uh, campgrounds can have that overflow area where you know you're not going to have all the, amenities. all the amenities that you want, but you can at least stay there. Yep. So anyway, we are curious what you think of that uh, proposal. 
And uh, you can uh, call our voicemail number, which is uh, 586-372-6990. Uh, leave us uh, what you think of that, uh, of that proposal that uh, Winston Slater has there. And we thank him for being our guest on the interview of the week. This is the part of the podcast where Tom and Patty Burkett take us to some off the beaten path spot where I bet you haven't been, but I bet you might want to put it on your bucket list. Hi, Mike and Jennifer. Are there no poor houses? asked Ebenezer Scrooge in the classic Christmas story. Yes, was the reply, but many would rather die than go there. English poorhouses were intended to punish shirkers. Poorhouses in this country were not so mean-spirited, at least in their intention. We had a chance to find out a lot about this period in our history when we visited the Wood County Historical Museum outside Bowling Green, Ohio. The museum once was a poorhouse, and most of its characteristic aspects have been well-preserved and interpreted. In addition, the exhibits include photos and information about all of the Ohio poorhouses, of which there were 88, one for each county. After the Civil War, these institutions fell under the control of the Ohio State Board of Charities. In answer to greatly varied and frequently inhumane conditions, the board was charged to provide regular inspections of each county poorhouse to assure that the care was conducted with attention to the comfort of those to whom the charity is extended and the convenience of those immediately charged with dispensing public charity. Almost without exception, the poorhouse was part of a farm on which the residents would raise much of the food necessary to feed them. Although many of the residents suffered from injuries sustained in the Civil War or from operating farm machinery, there was a general good spirit regarding the farm work and residents seemed proud of their efforts. After those with debilitating injuries, the next largest group of residents was widowed women and fatherless families. These women and children also worked at many tasks around the home, cooking, cleaning, canning, nursing, attending livestock, and foraging. Some became quite proficient and achieved a degree of fame within the poorhouse system. Inspired by their desire to live in agreeable quarters, these workers made every effort to be sure the home was clean, food was tasty and plentiful, and children were well cared for. Not all, or even a majority of needy residents came to live at the poorhouse. Many were simply awarded cash to help with heating, fuel, medical care, food, shoes, or burial. In the winter, residents cut ice from ponds on the property and stored it in a large ice house for use in food preservation and preparation. The ice house is preserved for observation and includes three levels of storage, double block walls with an intervening airspace that was filled with straw, and a large exterior pulley for hoisting and lowering the large blocks. The ice house was probably a favored place to visit on hot summer days, although the house itself is outfitted with large wraparound porches on each level for taking the cool evening air. Two other buildings stand close by the home, each a little chilling. One is the Pestilence House, where those afflicted by infectious diseases were housed and tended in hopes of their eventual rehabilitation. Sadly, few ever returned to their digs in the main building. The display here includes an early iron lung, a grim reminder of the prevalence of polio in that time period. Right next door to the Pest House is a considerably larger building called the Lunatic House. Sturdily built of brick, its first floor rooms include heavily barred windows. These cells were home to the violently insane, while those with milder conditions were treated in the second floor hospital ward. The interested visitor could easily spend half a day here, wandering the farm property, reading the displays, and visiting the variety of buildings, each with a story to tell. And speaking of stories, this museum houses the artifacts from another exquisitely grim tale, not associated with the poorhouse, that has been the subject of local, for, lo, local folklore for nearly a hundred years. We'll save that one for another day, or you can come find it on your own out here off the beaten path. That was so interesting. It was, and it's a, another example of something the Burkitts do so well in these off-the-beaten-path reports is they see a sign that says, you know, X, X County Historical Museum. They go and visit it, and every time they do, they find some fascinating 
off the beaten path report like that. You can read other reports from the uh, Burkitts on our rvlifestyle.com travel blog. There are regular posters there. And with that, we're done with episode 348, and our, our first video version. And thank you for being there for watching. Yep, a uh, new podcast every single Wednesday morning, now posted not just uh, on all your favorite uh, uh, podcast apps, but also on the RV Lifestyle channel on YouTube. We're Mike and Jennifer Wendland. Thank you for being with us. Happy trails.